Coming to you from deep inside the bowels of a great big empty. Get ready for another episode of The Home Defense Show with Skip Coriel. Hello, American families. Welcome back to this week's episode of The Home Defense Show. I'm your host, Skip Coriel. And if you love your family, care about them deeply, and want to learn how to protect them in every facet of your life, then you've come to the right place. We've got a great show for you today, and I know that you're going to love it. First off, we've got Inside Skip's Brain. We'll talk about the recesses, the icky, sticky, gooey masses that are inside my brain. And, and then we'll talk about what is in the news. And then coming up in segments two and three, we have a special treat for you. We have the Santa Shooter. I know it's not Christmas yet, but uh, this guy, Marcus Weldon, he has quite a story. Um, got his butt caught in the criminal justice ringer when he had to make a self-defense shooting. So Marcus is going to tell us all about his story, give you some words of wisdom. And then in segment four, as always, we'll have the wrap-up. But before we get into anything else, first we have to get this out of the way. Here it is. Every week I do this. You know what this is, don't you? You just know it. Oh, yeah. It's my only... Mountain Dew of the day. It's like a transfusion for me. It keeps me alive, keeps my blood pumping. If I don't have that one Mountain Dew, you know, the, the arteries, they just kind of harden right up and the blood slows down. I'm just not the same. You know, I've got to have all those chemicals that, that are inside there, but I only have one, so it must be okay. Well, what's going on in Skip's life, in the life of my family? Folks, it is coming up on mid-September. I've got that killing itch. Some of you will understand what I'm talking about. In about three weeks, it's going to be opening day of archery deer season up here in the woods of Michigan. I've got 20 acres here. I know that doesn't sound like much, but it's the right 20 acres. Basically, I bought a bedding area. I've got swamp. I've got woods. I planted a couple of food plots here. I'm surrounded by corn and soybeans. It is so nice of all those farmers to feed the deer for me so that I can shoot them later on. I just can't thank them enough for that. I went out checking my uh, trail cameras a couple of days ago. Oh, man, did I have a treat there. I've got this creek running through my property. Probably it ranges between, you know, eight and two feet wide, depending on, you know, where it is on the property. And I set up a trail camera looking right down the creek. And I pulled it up on my computer, and I see seven mature does walking right down that creek, right past my trail camera, right past one of my tree stands. And I thought, you know what? this is going to be good. I'll just get out there at the right time, watch my scent control, I'll be very careful, and I'll be able to pick out the deer that I want to eat this winter. It's kind of like going to the grocery store, only a heck of a lot more fun. So I'm really looking forward to that. I also, I've got four bucks on the property that I have on trail camera as well. Nothing really big, although I do know that there are some big ones here. And I plan on shooting a, a nice buck. Of course, every year I plan on that. It doesn't always happen, but I'm planning on it, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, what else have we been doing? Lots and lots of canning. I dehydrated some cabbage last night. We canned some more tomatoes, some more broccoli, some more cabbage, green beans. We are done pretty much with vegetables. I have a little bit more uh, tomatoes to can, and I have some beets. We haven't done our beets yet, and my wife loves beets. So, hey, I give my wife what she loves. It'll probably take us a couple of days just to can those beets, but, hey, we'll be eating them all winter long on into the spring. So, lots of hard work. The wood is almost in for the winter. My three kids are in there at homeschool right now, and there's reading and studying the Long Winter by Laura Ingalls Wilder. 
Boy, I gotta tell you, you can really learn how to take care of your family during hard times by reading those Laura Ingalls Wilder books. They have all types of instructions on how to heat your home, how to make food, uh, how to dry things, you name it. It's all there in those books and they're fun to read. My kids are learning how to fend for themselves and they don't even know it. So one of the upsides of homeschooling is you get to pick, to a large extent, what your kids learn and how they learn it. And they don't pick up all the crap that goes along with public school. We got that going on. All right, let's get into the news now. Of course, we have the hurricanes down there, Hurricane Harvey. That's about petered out. Now we got Hurricane Irma and a couple more threatening Florida and all that. You name it. But I, I want to talk about happy stuff today. So I went on uh, BearingArms.com and I found this article titled, This is Why You Always Carry Your Firearm in a Holster. Responsible gun owners know that if you're going to carry directly on your person, you never forego a holster. Tucking your firearm into the waistband of your pants, your belt, or your pocket is, simply put, an accident waiting to happen. Unfortunately, one Missouri gun owner never got the memo, or he did and just chose to ignore it. The man was shopping at a university city grocery store with a loaded firearm tucked into the waistband of his jeans without a holster. Since a waistband provides little to no support and fails to keep your weapon properly oriented, the handgun quickly began to slip down the man's pants. <laughs> I have a feeling I know what's going to happen. In his attempt to keep the gun from falling to the floor and with nothing protecting the trigger, the man accidentally discharged a single round and shot himself right in the leg. Could have been worse. The bullet proceeded to ricochet off the floor and lodge itself into the ceiling. Thankfully, no one else was hit, although a nearby shopper was struck with some debris, likely from the ceiling. According to police, the man was taken to a hospital and treated for non-life-threatening injuries. He is being charged with one count of discharging a firearm. If this story doesn't scare you off of holsterless carry, the number of other incidents of gun owners accidentally shooting themselves in the leg, abdomen, and yes, even the testicles, because they didn't think they needed a holster, certainly will. Ah, you know, that brings back memories for me. Not fond memories, and certainly not memories I'm proud of. I remember, you know, you guys are my friends, so I'll tell you this story. I don't even, I don't even think I have this in any of my books. Um, but this particular story, I was a, a single dad at the time, and I had my uh, two kids. They must have been about, I don't know, four and six years old, something like that. So this was a long time ago, probably about 16 years ago. You know, I had only been carrying concealed just a, a short time. And so I was dumb in some regards. So I was in a huge hurry, you know, being a single dad, custodial dad. I had a couple of jobs and I just didn't have time to do everything. So I was really, really rushed. I get home from one of my jobs and I noticed the kids, hey, you know, there's holes in your shoes. You guys need new shoes. And we had like 45 minutes to do it. So I said to the kids, okay, quick, you know, grab your stuff, get in the car, we're going. We rush out to the, the car. I had just enough time to take my pistol and I put it, I had an inside the waistband holster. And I put it inside the waistband in, in the back, the small of my back. And which would have been fine if, I'd wear, if I was wearing a belt, but I wasn't wearing a belt. So we go to Walmart and, uh, you know, we're shopping away back there in the shoe section. And I'm bending over to tie the shoes, try them on, get all that. And so I'm bending down, standing up, bending down, standing up. And I hear a voice behind me. Uh, a woman walks up behind me and says, can I help you with anything? So I stood up real fast. And when I did that, the gun comes out of my small of the back, lands on the floor, rolls around, and lands between this lady's legs. She was one of the uh, clerks there. And she saw that gun, and her face got really contorted and terrified. Her eyes got really big, and she didn't say anything. She turned and ran, and I thought, oh, crap, 
And of course, the kids were very helpful. Say, Dad, your your gun fell down, and so you know, I I pick it up, I put it back in the holster, and you know, cover it up. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, the SWAT team's going to be here pretty soon, and so I just stuck stuck around the area there, you know, finished getting the shoes, and I'm just waiting for you know whatever crap is going to hit the fan on this one because I know that I've really screwed up. So I got my CPL and my ID ready because I'm expecting the police to come. And I'd say probably about five minutes later, I glance over and there's a, a lady coming back and she's, she's walking with a purpose. And on her left and on her right, she's got two really big young guys, probably the biggest clerk she had in the store. And she's coming to take care of the problem. And she walks over to the shoe area, and I'm not there anymore. I'm a little farther off, and shes I can tell she's looking for me. And so I say, hey, over here, over here. And so she saw me, and I'm beckoning her to come over. So she walks up there, and she's got a real grim look on her face. And she says, are you the man with a gun? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I, I do have a gun, and I have a permit. You know, here's my identification. I'm very sorry that that happened. It was it was an accident. I'm just very sorry. And she looked, she's looking at my ID, and she says, well, you know, we don't allow guns in here. And I said, no, no, I, I didn't know that at all. And then I glanced over, and I pointed about 50 feet away, and I said, well, you sell guns in here. And she says, yeah, but those are our guns. We don't want other people bringing guns into the store. And I said, ma'am, I happen to know that Walmart does not have a policy against guns in their store when they're being legally carried. And I could tell she was thinking about that real hard. You know, My guess was she didn't know what the corporate policy was. She just knew that, hey, I got to respond to this because I got a report from one of my employees. So, And the two muscle guys that are just standing there with their arms crossed looking tough. And uh, I thought about it for a second. You know, my two little kids are standing right there. And I said, ma'am, why don't we do this? How about if I promise you that I'll be more responsible and that what just happened today will never, ever happen again? And she thought about it. And finally she said, okay, fine. She handed me back her ID. Her and her two bodyguards walked away. And that was the end of it. That could have been a really bad situation for me. I mean, I didn't do anything illegal. I just did something stupid. And so it would have been very embarrassing. The moral of the story is, the moral of the story is, you know, not only carry your gun in a holster, but carry it properly in your holster. This happens more often than, than you know about because most people aren't stupid enough to get on the radio and talk about it. But it's a teaching moment, and I am an instructor, so learn from my mistakes, okay? All right, well, hey, we are about out of time for this segment. But coming up in segment two, we are going to have Marcus Weldon, a.k.a. the Santa Shooter. And you're going to learn all about his story. It's a fascinating story, and that is coming up. While I'm away, go on Amazon.com and do a search on The Santa Shooter by Marcus Weldon. Just skim through that synopsis, and you will have a head start on everyone else. All right, this is Skip Coriel on The Home Defense Show. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. My name is C.J. Coriel. Welcome to the Home Defense Show with my dad, Skip Coriel. Don't go nowhere. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want to talk to you about keeping your kids safe around guns. I've never been a big fan of trigger locks, but I have to tell you, I have found a product called Child Safe One. It's a trigger blocker, not a trigger lock, and it works fantastic. I tried it out on my kids, and they could not get the Child Safe One off the training gun. 
I gave them five minutes. I sat there and I watched them and they couldn't do it. Folks, I am satisfied, more than satisfied, that my kids are safe around Child Safe One. Here's the good thing about it. I can get that lock off the gun in under two seconds, but my kids can't even figure out how it works. Child Safe One is a win-win for everyone in the family. My wife's happy because she knows the guns are secure. My kids are happy because they're safe. And I'm happy because when the wolf comes a-knocking, I've got that gun cocked, locked, and ready to rock in less than two seconds. So go to GlobalGunSafety.com and get Child Safe One today. That's GlobalGunSafety.com. Check it out now and tell them the Home Defense Show sent you. Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. We have on the line with us now Marcus Weldon from the uh, Detroit area in Michigan. Uh, Marcus, welcome to the Home Defense Show. Thanks for having me on, Skip. All right. Hey, Marcus, you uh, have a very unusual, unique story. Uh, you were playing a Santa Claus a few years back, and you you got in a self-defense shooting, and, boy, you got you kind of got caught in the uh, criminal justice system ringer, um, and you've been having a tough time uh, of it. Can you just, first off, just tell the folks a little bit about yourself um, for a minute or so, and then launch into your story. What exactly happened to you, Marcus? Yeah, well, um, this was back in 2014. At the time, I was 25 years old. I was working at a promotional event for a company called Soho that does promotions at different uh, clubs and different um, venues. And it was the theme of that night was uh, Christmas theme because it was December, of course. And so they wanted everyone to dress in uh, some kind of Christmas attire, so they picked me to dress as the Santa Claus. So I ended up uh, making my way to the event and later on leaving the event and happened to help a young lady with a tire it was one of my co-workers she had a flat tire and um, it was late at night and the situation got ugly when some individuals approached her and uh, ended up becoming a physical altercation between her and one young, one of the young men uh, the young man was drunk, drunk and intoxicated, I could tell this way he was slurring his words. And when he put his hands on her, I intervened, and he put his hands on me. We got into a physical altercation, and he ended up uh, calling for some type of backup. He was actually from, uh, I think, Yemen. He, uh, Yemenese, I believe. And uh, he said it, uh, He said something to his partner, who he was with in a different language. I wasn't sure what he said, so at that moment, the, the fear was heightened. And I felt at that moment that um, I needed, I warned him that I had a firearm because I felt that was the best thing to do because I was not sure what he was saying to his friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ended up running back to the car, retrieving his firearm, and that's when I uh, pulled mine and, and uh, shot four shots, hitting him and his and his partner in the arm. Wow. Hitting him twice and hitting his partner. Um, so and, and I ended up getting charged with seven felonies for it because evidence is kind of withheld and the scene was crime scene was cleaned up by his partner. Wow! Did you say seven felonies? Did I hear that right? Seven felonies. Oh my gosh! They they kind of piled on uh, uh, with that one. I, I know they do that sometimes. They'll pile on a whole bunch of felonies, outrageous charges, in hopes that you'll just plea bargain down uh, so that it's an easy win for them um but apparently you didn't plea bargain yeah i didn't take the plea i was facing 30 years but i went on and stuck it out and um eventually i was exonerated and through my entire ordeal uh just to keep my sanity i ended up writing a book about the whole process it was actually my journal and became my book Mm -hmm. but um it just was kind of uh just a, a, a crazy story that i felt that i needed to put in writing just in case uh, I didn't make it out. I had something that, you know, people can kind of pick up and know what happened. And um, it's just been from this point downhill because it's still continuous. I spent over, over, over twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in legal fees easily. Oh, wow. Over the, three, over the past two and a half, three years. Mm-hmm. So did you end up with a public defender or did you get a, a private attorney? Private attorney. Wow. Did you have a private attorney as well as experts as well. Mm-hmm. Did you have any type of uh, legal protection service, or this was all everything was coming out of your pocket? Everything was coming out of my pocket. Oh my gosh! 
Oh man, that's like every gun owner's nightmare right there. Well, absolutely. Well, well, Marcus, tell me a little bit about the the two people that attacked you. Uh, what's their background? Well, I'm not sure. One of them left the country. He didn't ever. She never showed up to court. And the other one, he came and he got caught in a bunch of lies. But I know they own gas stations. I believe that's mm-hmm. the only thing I know about them. Wow, and they're they're originally from uh, Yemen. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, you know, you went through this whole trial. You went through um, a jury trial, so you went through the whole process, and you were acquitted. Is that correct? Correct. Wow. That you know, what happened to your family during all this? I mean, do you do you have a wife and kids? What what's what's the deal with that? I have a daughter. Um, she, you know, I actually have full custody of my daughter. She stays with me. I'm not married. I do have a girlfriend, but uh, I have you know, my entire family was the victim of as far as I'm concerned in this whole process. Mm-hmm. Um, she was at the time five years old. I had to take pretty much kind of all the just uh, stories thrown at her in the news. And even at five years old, kids still kind of can pick and understand certain things. So yeah. It was tough on her. And, and uh, she's right now in therapy as well. Just kind of, I try to keep her in therapy and talk to somebody once or twice a month. Yeah. Um, so did you actually have to spend time in jail? And if so, how much? Uh, I spent a bare minimum time. It was, uh, 70, it was just over 72 hours, close to four days. Mm-hmm. And, um, the rest of the time I was on the tether device, which was considered house arrest. Well, it sounds like they should have put that one, uh, Yemeni guy on uh tether device cause he left the country. Yeah, yeah. Well, they didn't consider him at the time. They considered him a victim. And, um, <laughs> so I, it's just I, I don't, Marcus. Crazy. I do not understand that. I mean, because everything came out in the case, the, the facts were brought out, and you were exonerated. Why was it you were considered uh, to be the bad guy, and they were considered the victims? Well, one thing at the time. Um, the clerk, he actually had my, he actually had made statements referring to two guns. He disappeared, and um, as, as well as the main witness who I had the altercation with. So, once the witnesses disappeared and camera footage was uh, wasn't found until later on, it became my word against some people who didn't even show up to court. Hmm. Which they, uh, you know, just a, a statement made by the uh, other individual who who was in the car. But other than that, you know, it was my word against his. So how long did this whole thing? Cameras came out. Yeah, how long did this drag out, uh, Marcus? About a year and a half. Wow, a year and a half of your life. You must have been going bonkers. Yeah, yeah, I still am. <laughs> oh, you still are. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I'm just, it's just, it's just draining. Yeah, well, em- just like right now, just tired, just tired. Yeah, well, emotionally, you know, to be put on hold like that. I mean, the hope for a year and a half, you're you're thinking, am I going to go to prison for this? I mean, there must have been a time. Uh, did they offer you a a plea bargain or or not? Yeah, they offered me one for five years and then one year in jail. Wow! And you didn't you didn't take the one year in jail. Um, you know, a lot of people probably would have taken that one year in jail, even though they're innocent, just because they didn't want to end up spending their whole lives in, in prison. Uh, was that a difficult choice for you? It was very difficult. I mean, weighing options, but I knew I was innocent, so I just stuck to my guts and just went with what, what I felt was right. Yeah. So um, how about your family? Did, did your family stick by you through this or, or not? Oh, yeah. My family stuck with me through the whole length of the way. If it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't have had the, uh, the, the means to get through it. Yeah. Well, God bless uh, your family for that then, because, you know, I've never been through anything like that. And, boy, I know it's, if something like that happened to me, my my wife would be going bonkers, uh, my, my kids would. And I think, honestly, I mean, I would be tempted to take the easy one year just for closure for my family so that I know that, all right, I spent a year in prison. I can still come home after that. And, and you know, that's probably what the prosecutor was uh, was counting on. Um, 
you know, I know you don't want to be bad mouthing anybody or anything, but tell me a little bit about the prosecutor, because from what I'm hearing right now, I don't like this prosecutor, and I don't even know who it is. Yeah, the prosecutor in Detroit is one of the worst in the country, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our top prosecutor, uh, yeah, Kim Worthy, is one of the worst, worst in the country. Um, but unfortunately, no one has ran against her, so she's just got popular by the, just just by default. What what and, county um, what county is this in? Uh, Wayne County. Wayne County. Okay. Wayne County. Yeah. So so this is like, well, Motor City, right? I mean, that's the jurisdiction. Yep, this is Motor City, correct? Yeah. Um, okay, so then, I mean, you were on hold for a year and a half, and you basically you had to stay inside your house for a year and a half. Is that how it worked? Uh, yes, and I can leave and go, leave and come as I go as far as somewhere like work or to take my daughter from school. Wow. You know, but you were able to keep interacting with, with your little girl then? Yes. Oh, thank God for that because, boy, that can really screw up a family and that can screw up a dad too. I mean, how did you keep sane through all of this? Through my faith in God and my church, I just, and I started to read a lot. Uh, books really helped me out a lot. I uh, started to really study a lot about the Second Amendment as well, and I learned a lot about the whole, just the history behind it. And it just kept me sane and kept me in, in, um, in, uh, influenced as far as knowing that I can make it out of here. I met a lot of people who were Second Amendment advocates who called me on a regular Hmm. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. All right. Uh, we're just about out of time for this segment. So let's take up where we left off um, talking about the Second Amendment advocacy, um, you know, as soon as we get back. Uh, this is Skip Correll. We're on the Home Defense Show. We're speaking with Marcus Weldon. Um, you got two minutes to listen to all of our top sponsors. One of them is firearms legal protection. So I you ought to be thinking, if you don't have firearms legal protection, you ought to be thinking about that right now. This is Skip Coriel on the Home Defense Show. We will be right back. This is Phoenix Coriel on the Home Defense Show. Always use guns safely and wisely. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want to talk to you about keeping your kids safe around guns. I've never been a big fan of trigger locks, but I have to tell you, I have found a product called Child Safe One. It's a trigger blocker, not a trigger lock, and it works fantastic. I tried it out on my kids, and they could not get the Child Safe One off the training gun. I gave them five minutes. I sat there, and I watched them. And they couldn't do it. Folks, I am satisfied, more than satisfied, that my kids are safe around Child Safe One. Here's the good thing about it. I can get that lock off the gun in under two seconds, but my kids can't even figure out how it works. Child Safe One is a win-win for everyone in the family. My wife's happy because she knows the guns are secure. My kids are happy because they're safe. And I'm happy because when the wolf comes a-knocking, I've got that gun cocked, locked, and ready to rock in less than two seconds. So go to GlobalGunSafety.com and get Child Safe One today. That's GlobalGunSafety.com. Check it out now and tell them the Home Defense Show sent you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if life was like the movies and the good guys always won? In today's world, if you're forced to use your firearm to protect yourself, you will need protection. Firearms Legal Protection is here for you. FLP provides you with seasoned, experienced attorneys that handle your criminal and civil matters as a result of you protecting yourself. FirearmsLegal.com provides its members with uncapped attorney's fees, bail bond protection, and coverage in all 50 states. We are not a reimbursement plan. You can access uncapped attorney's fees for as low as $10 a month. Firearms Legal members are provided with educational services, training videos, and access to our vast national attorney network. While you're protecting yourself, let Firearms Legal protect you. Listen up, folks. This is important. There are plenty of legal protection services out there, but none will protect you as well as Firearms Legal Protection. This is the one I use and the only one I recommend. Visit FirearmsLegal.com slash Midwest Tactical and protect your family now.
Okay, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. We are speaking with Marcus Weldon. Uh, Marcus, they nicknamed you, the media did, the Santa Shooter, and I assume that's because you were dressed up as a Santa Claus at the time of the altercation. Correct. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was the name they dubbed me. <laughs> you know, that's. I was looking online, doing a little bit of research, and, and I see a picture of you on the ground in a Santa Claus suit, surrounded by by police officers, and I think you were handcuffed on your stomach. Man, that's you can't you can't make this stuff up. That that's just bizarre. What was it like being handcuffed, thrown down on the ground, face down, in a Santa Claus suit? I just remember that cold pavement pressing against my face, and I just remember thinking to myself, like, my life is over. I just I kept thinking that in my mind, like, life life is getting ready to change. You know, I just knew that at that moment, that everything that I knew was going to be taken away from me and possibly everything I loved as well. So I knew that uh, life was going to change. I mean, just just trying to bottle that up inside my head and just, just realize, like, this is not a dream. This is real. Wow. And And then you ended up... Uh, three days in in jail waiting was it like a holding cell or were you in general population what was that like i went from a holding cell to general population so it was a mixture of both oh so just a, a lot of cracked and smelly toilets and loud talking oh, people gosh oh man you okay when we when we broke from segment two you were talking about second amendment advocacy and i know um, that you've gotten a lot more involved in that because I met you at the Second Amendment March uh, in Lansing at the state capitol just this past spring. Talk to me about who you got to know and just uh, what you've done to help promote the, the Second Amendment. Well, I've done a lot of speeches. I spe- spoke at Lansing, actually, for the Second Amendment um, March, and uh, I believe that's where I met you at. Yes, that's correct. And uh, Yes, and... C.J. Grisham from Open Carry, Texas, was one of the advocates that really helped me out a lot. Rick Hector as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I also met Terry Johnson, attorney Terry, Terry Johnson. Pretty much I, I've been just voicing, like, you know, spreading the story. Of course, I have my book. I've been pushing my book and spreading the word and uh, trying to get more people involved and, and, and also wait, raise the awareness about the programs like uh, firearms legal protection, which yeah. I wish I had. Oh, gosh, yeah. You know, that's probably one of the regrets that you have. But the thing is, no one knows. It's like, how do you know when lightning is going to strike you and where? You just don't know. But, man, I bet you got firearms legal protection now, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so do I. So do I. Because you just, you never, ever, ever know. Marcus, what is going on right now? Because I think you alluded to some ongoing legal problems. You've been acquitted. What could possibly be going wrong now? Well, you would think everything is okay, should be okay, but um, unfortunately I just found out after being pulled over by a state trooper and kind of harassed that I have, I'm still out on bond and um, I, sh- I cannot own a firearm. I can't carry a firearm. And uh, unfortunately the courts, some kind of paper that were mixed up. I'm still out on bond at this moment right now. So I ended up going down to the court trying to get this straightened out, and he blew me off. So I ended up having to hire an attorney, and I hired Terry Johnson. Um, so now I'm back to paying uh, money for attorney fees, and I'm actually uh, right now raising the money to do that. Wow. You know what? Let's get this uh, out of the way right now. If someone wants to to donate um, to your, your legal fund, because you've been through the ringer here, and you've done a lot for the Second Amendment, where can they go to help you out with your with your legal fees? Well, my Facebook, Marcus Allen Weldon, M-A-R-C-U-S-A-L-L-E-N-W-E-L-D-O-N. There's a fundraiser account that I had for my original uh, expenses, and it's still open. So I, I just reposted on my page. It's a, uh, it's a goal uh, with a, a fundraiser, it's, yeah, fundraiser.com account, and um, it, you'll see it right when you go on my page my Facebook page, and um, you also my I Support Marcus Weldon is also a Facebook page. Five, ten bucks, whatever you can, people, I tell anybody, if, if you actually, if actually what I said too is if you donate over 30 bucks, I'll send you a book as well. Oh, awesome, a awesome. copy of my book. Well, t- tell you what I'll do, Marcus, I'll, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and I'll send something out to everyone on my email list and uh, also on my Facebook and on uh, homedefenseshow.com, 
I'll go ahead and put the link to your Facebook page so people can give to that. And boy, you would think that they would just leave you alone now. I mean, they have tormented you enough. The state obviously was wrong because the jury said, hey, prosecuting attorney, you are wrong. This guy is innocent. So they should leave you alone. Uh, did I did I hear you say that you hadn't uh, even gotten your firearm back yet? Yeah, they still have that in custody. I haven't got it back yet either, and I'm just trying to figure out how to get that back. So I got Terry on that as well. <laughs> that's just that's just amazing. When you get wrapped around the axle, you know, with the government, it's like they can do good things, but when they do something wrong, it just seems like they just double down and just keep doing bad over and over and over again and we we definitely we want to help you out with this because this is just ridiculous before we get off on too far on a tangent you know i want to hear about your uh, your book tell us about your book well i of course i i, I take you step by step through the whole ordeal from the, from the day it happened to the case to the trial to the jury but i also capture moments in my life uh, through it uh, that ties into the story. Mm-hmm. Moments of my childhood, moments of me, uh, why, did, why did I carry a firearm? My best friend was carjacked and murdered. I wow. talk about that. I talk about my entire life as, as, a, as, a, as a kid in Detroit and how I got custody of my daughter. You know, my, Actually, my daughter's mother, unfortunately, was um, I became an alcoholic and strung out on drugs, so it left me in the position I had to take full custody. Mm-hmm. And I just got custody that year, so um, you can imagine after just getting custody and then catch the case like six months later, it's crazy. Yeah. So I, I take you through the entire meat grinding process, being exonerated. Yeah. Well, what What is the the title of the, of the book, Marcus? The Santa Shooter: Guilty and Proven Innocent. Um, it's actually on Amazon and on my website, MarcusWeldon.com. Of course, Amazon is one of the best distributors out there. Like a lot of people love Amazon, so if you type in my name or the Santa Shooter, uh, guilty and proven innocent, it'll pop right up. Okay. Well, what I'll do, yeah, I'll put MarcusWeldon.com dot com uh, on my website and on my Facebook page and show everyone there. I mean, they can they can support you in your legal efforts just by buying uh, the book and get a good read and a good product in the process. I know I'll certainly I will order it for myself today. I'll recommend that everyone else do that as well. Your little girl now, she she was five, so she must be close to, what, eight years old now? Yeah, she's eight. eight actually, yep, she turned eight in April. Marcus, my, my heart goes goes out to you. I mean, that's something that no one even wants to dream that could happen to them. I want to thank you for sticking it out and going through all that because... You managed to exonerate yourself. You held your family together. I'm guessing that your relationship with God got closer, uh, stronger. Is, is that correct or, or not? Yes, definitely got closer and stronger, definitely. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your church family, because they must have been instrumental. Yes, my church, uh, Martin Evans Missionary ba- Baptist Church, it's a smaller church in the east side of Detroit. And they uh, walk with a big stick, as they say. <laughs> Small church where they walk with a big stick. So it's it, they they stuck out there and they filled that courtroom every single uh, motion and every single court date. They packed that room out. I have been a, a Christian since I was, you know, like four years old. You know, born and raised in a Baptist church in a teeny tiny little town in in West Michigan. And I gotta tell you, you know, when you get in hard times, it's God and family that will get you through those hard times. And if you don't have God or family, oh, man, it's Katie bar the door. You can just go crazy. So I, I imagine there's some something in your book about your relationship with God and uh, how your family yes. stuck by you. Definitely. I, I compare my story to Job. <laughs> oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Losing it all. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the stories, the theme, the kind of the theme of the book is kind of like the story of Job, how I, I you know, kind of phrased it and, yeah. um, and just used examples in the book. And it's a definitely an inspirational story, and I hope it can change lives. You know, I've always been fascinated, you know, with the African American uh, culture, you know, primarily because, okay, I'm a white guy, all right? I mean, 
And I was, I'm a white guy. I was born and raised out in the country. I don't think I saw a black person till I was, I don't know, like eight or nine years old. And that was in Kalamazoo, you know, during the race riots in Detroit. And I thought, my gosh, I, my, my, my only concept of a black person was seeing them riot on television. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, am I in danger? You know, am I going to be killed by this black person? And then I went in the Marine Corps. And then I grew to understand, well, they're people, you know, in the Marine Corps. We're not black. We're not white. We're all olive drab kind of a deal. But I've always been fascinated by that. And uh, I, I think we have a friend in common. Oh, you've mentioned Rick Ector. But also, uh, I think you know uh, Reverend Ken Blanchard, uh, blackmanwithagun.com. Yes. yes. Super guy. He, he's one of my authors from White Feather Press. What is it like to grow up in inner city Detroit surrounded by violence and and drug use because most of my listeners they don't they don't know and and they don't understand what is it like it's tough you know I, and I get I give a really detailed overview of it in my book very detailed and um just like I said best friend murdered killed uh, carjacked and um just I remember catching the bus and I would see uh drug addicts shoot heroin right next to me and stuff in the phone booth and stuff and it just was normalized so gangs and drugs kind of normalized so you kind of become your environment yeah and you, your mind is incubated and it's so long to the point where it becomes you and you have a culture shock you're like you had a you had a culture shock when you actually uh you know when you went to the marine corps yeah yeah so that was a that was a kind of a culture shock and you know i too experienced it when i went and i uh, ended up moving to the the rural area for a minute with a relative mm -hmm. ended up seeing a different side yeah of uh the different side of the state of michigan saying that everything wasn't like detroit so it was uh it was a change it's an environment that really um can destroy you if you're not careful and mm -hmm. don't have a support system well but so but you're in a, a rural area living now uh well actually i'm in you know the middle suburb area between detroit and um kind of you know i guess you would call it a rural area it's a lot of trees so mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know i just kind of you know i kind of stay in the middle i'm not really too much of a city guy anymore i don't like a lot of people i mean i, I kind of deal with a little bit of i guess i almost want to say pro post-traumatic stress from the situation I yeah i've like been around people but at the same time i'm also i get lonely so i try to stay in the middle well you know i can't say as i blame you for that uh, I don't like going to the big city. I was born and raised out in the country. And when I mean country, I mean like I'm surrounded by corn and soybeans. And uh, so when I go into Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, I'm on a high alert. And I imagine for someone who's been uh, attacked, uh, that's got to be probably double and, and triple stress uh, for you. Uh, you know, Marcus, we're, yes. uh, we're about out of time here. I really appreciate your candor. Uh, how open th that you've been with us and for sharing your story. One more time, how can people get a hold of you and help you out uh, in your, your legal battles? Marcus Allen Weldon is my Facebook. If you buy my book, I mean, that's actually one of the best ways to support, actually, uh, just buying the book. It's on Kindle for 10 bucks as well. You can download it on your phone, Amazon, the Santa Shira Guilty and the Proven Innocent. That's probably one of the best ways to support is buy the book and you also must read the story. Okay. Well, hey, that's what we'll do then, Marcus. I'll be pointing everyone to Amazon and get uh, see how many books we can sell today. Now, later today, you're going to be, be interviewed by NRA TV, correct? Yep. Cam Edwards. I'll be on at 420 Eastern. All right. Well, people can look forward to that as well. Marcus, we're out of time. Thank you very much for being on. We appreciate you very, very much. We wish you the best. And please keep us posted because we will come back to this story yep. Uh, when the final happy ending is there. Thank you very much, Marcus. All right, thank you. All right, this is Skip Coriel on Home Defense Show. While I'm away for the next two minutes, go on Amazon.com, do a search on Marcus Weldon, the Santa shooter. Read that real quick, take you about two minutes. When you come back, we'll do the wrap-up. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Welcome to my dad's home defense radio show. You're going to love it. Hey, folks. This is Skip Coriel, host of the Home Defense Show. 
I want to tell you about my book, Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book. More and more people across the country are seeing the dangers in society and deciding to carry concealed to protect themselves and their families. My new book lays it out step by step. It'll teach you how to protect and defend the ones you love. Get the benefit of 17 years of teaching experience and a lifetime of training for this important role in society and in your family. You can get civilian combat real easy. Just go to Amazon.com, search on Skip Coriel Civilian Combat, it'll pop right up there. Don't put it off any longer. Get Civilian Combat, the Concealed Carry Book, by yours truly, Skip Coriel. This is Skip Coriel from the Home Defense Show, and I want you to have the very best handgun that money can buy. And that's why we recommend you visit Larry Jackson at Elite Firearms and Training. As a concealed carry instructor, I see people every week out on the range with guns they can't shoot properly because they didn't know what to buy. That will never happen at Elite Firearms and Training. Larry Jackson will personally fit you with your very own personal defense pistol. So call Larry Jackson today at 616-299-8715 or visit EliteFirearms.us. All right, folks, welcome back to the Home Defense Show. This is your host, Skip Coriel. That was a fantastic two segments there with Marcus Weldon, the Santa Shooter. That's good alliteration, isn't it? Santa Shooter. Kind of sad, though, isn't it? I mean, my gosh. A year and a half of the man's life, not flushed down the toilet, but, man, they sure did run that guy through the ringer. You know, there's two things he can thank God for. One... He didn't get shot, and he wasn't killed. I mean, the guy lived through a firefight with two other men, two other aggressors. So he took on multiple assailants. And in my mind, that that gained some respect right there. So he took on two guys, and he lived to tell about it. You know, and I guess, you know that phrase, better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6. That's true in, in his case. It really is. I mean, yeah, he got wrapped around the criminal justice axle there. And, boy, they just did their best to do him in and and put him in prison. But they didn't do it. He worked hard. He fought hard. He didn't give in. He didn't plea bargain. And he got out of it alive with his freedom and with his life. You know, I was wondering, you know, just how much race played in this particular case. I, I, I really don't know. And it's not like the county prosecutor is going to tell you the truth about something like that. But there were two races that were in play here. One was African American, and uh, the other was, well, Islamic. I'm assuming that the uh, two Yemenis were Muslim, um, because that's what most of them are. You know, off air, uh, Marcus was did tell me that, yeah, this was a predominantly Uh, Muslim neighborhood. Uh, So I just wonder about that. You know, is justice blind when it comes to religion and race and things of that nature? I don't think it always is. Justice is only as good as the people who are trying to uphold it. And in this case, I I think he got a raw deal. I, I think poor Marcus got shafted on this one, and he's still being shafted on this one. So we got to support the guy. I went online, I went to Amazon.com, and I purchased a Kindle copy of The Santa Shooter, Guilty Until Proven Innocent. I like that title. That's uh, poetic, and it seems to be accurate in this uh, case. Here's the introduction. I've had an interesting journey throughout my short life. I've lost friends to street violence and others I had to cut loose in order to find myself, my true self. Never was it in my plan to write a book. Some may consider it an autobiography of the earlier stages of my life, but I consider it personal memoirs, life lessons told in a story, like format and placed in a book. It contains the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in my life, which prepared me to face off with one of the most challenging situations that black men face in America, the challenge of an innocent man fighting through the corrupt and unpredictable jaws of the justice system. Well, I don't think uh, Marcus is pulling any punches on that one. He's pretty much, he just comes right out and says what I was suspecting. 
In 2014, I gained full custody of my six-year-old daughter. I participated on Detroit Mayor Mike Dugan's Recreational Advisory Board. I was mentoring young men through a program with the former Detroit Mayor, Dave Bing. I was in school learning to be a building engineer. In my spare time, I would teach kids hands-on applications of skilled trades through a nonprofit organization called Redeem Detroit. I was earning respect in the community and being the responsible citizen I thought every young man should be. After a long night working at a Christmas fundraiser, a friend of mine and I had an encounter with two men that has changed my life completely. The media and the courts had gotten this case all wrong, but of course, it was up to me and my defense to prove it. Wow. That is an incredible story, and of course, that's just the beginning. That's just the introduction. Man, I tell you, he stuck it out. He did the right thing. You know, I honestly don't know if I would have had, I guess, the, the staying power, the stick-to-it attitude that it takes to go through something like that. I mean, I probably would, but, you know, if that happened to me, basically what you're talking about is you're facing a lifetime in prison. And it's not just a lifetime in prison, because I have three little kids at home and a wife. I don't know if I could handle a lifetime away from my kids, being locked up, knowing that I was innocent and that my rights had been violated, knowing that every moment, every second, every minute I was in that prison cell, my kids were growing up. They're getting older, and basically, your, your life has been stolen when you are wrongly convicted, the government has stolen your life from you. And that can never, ever be replaced. You can't get that back. Once the kids are grown up, they're gone. And it's not like you can counteract anything that's going on around them. You know, what the other kids are telling them or um, what a bitter spouse or ex-spouse or whatever might tell them. You just you just don't know about that. And you can't change that. That would be the worst thing that could happen to me, I think. Uh, in some respects, I think I'd rather die than go through something like that. Because the one thing I can't live without is my kids. I love my kids so much. And, and I know what it's like to lose your kids because I've been through two divorces. And in the first divorce, I did lose my kids to the degree that I saw them, you know, like a few hours on Wednesday and then every other weekend. And that was just terrible for me. So I can't imagine living through prison time, a lifetime of prison. You know, I, I would have to take my own advice and just get close to God because my family wouldn't be there. I'd do my best, but man, it would be so tempting to take that one year in prison because that's a sure thing. But Marcus did not do it. So, hey, my hat's off to him. He, uh, he made the gutsy move, and he did the right thing. And, boy, had a happy ending. Now, not an ending quite yet. He's still going through this. Because of a clerical error or a mix-up or something, the uh, court clerk or the county clerk, whoever's in charge of this, did not take him off bond. According to the state police, he's still a bad guy, and he doesn't have his legal rights, his gun rights, and that's just flat out wrong. They need to fix that. I mean, it'd be one thing if he went in there, like he said he did, to fix the error, and they just kind of blew him off. Said, no, nope, sorry, you can't do this. You know, it's just, it is what it is. That's wrong. To make a man, after everything that they've done to him, go out and hire a lawyer again because he had to prove his innocence once in court to the jury to be acquitted of seven felony charges. That's huge. And now after he did everything right, due process played itself out. They stole a year and a half of his life. That's not enough. They're trying to steal more. I think they need to fix this and they need to fix this right now. If they don't, then I'm going to have to get involved in this uh, politically, and we'll have to start something. You know, I don't like fighting. I don't even like politics. But if they don't make this right, uh, we're going to have to do some marches, some rallies, and uh, 
make this an issue because it's just not right what they're doing to this man. Ah, boy, you know, it stresses me out just talking about this. But hey, things like this happen in life, and you got to be tough. Life is not for wimps. Uh, life is for tough guys. And Marcus is a tough guy. And he'll make it through. He'll be fine. But in the meantime, what I'd like you to do is please go on to his Facebook page, facebook.com slash Marcus Allen Weldon. And that's spelled M-A-R-C-U-S-A-L-L-E-N-W-E-L-D-O-N. Check out his Facebook page. I believe he also has a website, MarcusWeldon.com. But if you can afford 10 bucks, hey, slip the guy 10 bucks, 10, 15, 20, you know, whatever you can spare. Because the guy has been wrongly persecuted, and now they're going in for more. So, you know, and if you live in Wayne County, call up this county prosecutor and say, what the hell are you doing to this guy? He was found not guilty by a jury of his peers, and now you're still tearing this guy down. And the thing that aggravates me more than anything else is they're not hurting just him. They're hurting his little girl. His eight-year-old little girl has been through enough. Okay, so you can't hurt Marcus anymore without hurting his little girl and his, his mom and dad and his brothers and sisters, his family, his church. They've been through enough. Leave this poor man alone. So if you've got any pull over there in Wayne County, get on the phone and just raise some holy hell because it certainly would be holy hell. All right, go on Amazon.com, and I want you to pick up Marcus's book, Marcus Weldon, The Santa Shooter. Just do a search on that. It'll come right up there. I've read part of it already, and it's a good read. Another thing you need to do, firearms legal protection. Oh, folks, if you can listen to that story, and you don't have any type of legal protection, and you're a gun owner, man, what are you waiting for? I mean, Marcus waited too late, and it cost him uh, 30000 bucks, and he's not done yet. It's going to cost more. So please, go to firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical. Check out the plans. They're nine ninety five a month, and you don't have to worry about this. Firearmslegal.com slash Midwest Tactical, and uh, you can take care of it right now today for nine ninety five a month. Enough of that. Okay, folks, that about wraps it up for this week's episode of the Home Defense Show. Next week, we will be having a special episode on the preseason deer archery season. Why? Because I'm a fanatical bow hunter. That's why I'm getting ready on October 1st to go out there and, and just do a number on Bambi. So I'm bringing in my friends from Big Buck Registry. They have their uh, podcast. They're based right here in Michigan like me. Check it out at BigBuckRegistry.com. Uh, my friend uh, Jim Keller, uh, who I met at SHOT Show um, just this past January. We had a nice talk. And then his co-host, Kurt Geyer, working class bow hunter, and Billy Joe Lunchbucket. Now, <laughs> Billy Joe Lunchbucket. I, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> It just sounds like like my kind of a show. We're going to talk about the uh, 2017 deer season, the archery season, you know, maybe a forecast uh, local here in Michigan as well as national, maybe get some scouting tips. But, hey, going out, killing deer, gutting them out, dragging them back in, processing them, that's all part of taking care of your family. It's home defense against hunger. And that's what next week's show is going to be all about. All right. Well, so we'll see you next week for Home Defense Against Hunger. Until then, remember, your purpose in life is to find something greater than yourself and serve it. Always remember, God, family, country, in that order. It's important how you live, but it's equally important how you die. Your family and the ones you love need your protection, so train, always train, stay alert, stay alive. Until next week on the Home Defense Show, this is your host, Skip Coriel. God bless you, God bless your family, and God bless America. Hoorah.
Thank you for joining us this week on The Home Defense Show. Now, get out there and protect the ones you love. We'll see you next week with more of the best in home defense. Bye-bye, boys! Have fun storming the castle!